are you guilty of being a neutrochondriac? I have no idea what that is either. Apparently, it's when you diagnose yourself with a food intolerance that you don't actually have. We're all want to be doctors, aren't we, thanks to the internet. Well, a study that's been done by DNA Fit found as many as one in three Brits have self-diagnosed. And while 45% of us say we have a food allergy or intolerance, the truth is only 15% of us actually do. Well, to talk more about this, we have Olympic medalist and head of product at DNA Fit, Andrew Steele. Good morning Good to morning. you. So, what is a neutrochondriac exactly? So this is a really interesting term from this research we commissioned where actually we're looking at people who might self-diagnose themselves with a food intolerance or allergy um, without really looking at any sort of scientifically backed evidence for why they have those symptoms or sometimes even if they don't even have any symptoms themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is a basic, basic way to show look, we're all very different, we're very individual in the way we sort of respond to our food and it's, it's getting more so. And so we're trying to understand sort of the reasons why and, and how people go about making that decision. Yeah, so give me an example. I mean, I've got a lot of friends at the moment who are who say they're gluten intolerant and I've spoken to uh, people that suffer from celiac disease here on the show and that's life-threatening to them however so many people now just say I'm gluten intolerant because they feel bloated is that is is that right? Are they right to self-diagnose like that or is it actually a load of old fooey? Well, there's nothing wrong necessarily with actually you know, saying that you do have these symptoms. If you do genuinely have some symptoms from eating a food, then you, you should look into that and mm -hmm. we should rather quantify that rather than just make a decision. Like some of the interesting stats here, I think almost two thirds of the people that said they had a problem said they were more influenced by an external person or thing, sometimes by a celebrity on social media, rather than their own symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you, look, you, may be, um, you may have some issue, you may have an intolerance, but you must listen to your own symptoms and if those symptoms are serious enough you must uh, speak to a GP or get those checked out. Yeah it's interesting isn't it there's a lot of clickbait on social media you always see the top five reasons why you might be feeling like this and you click on it it lists five things and you immediately identify with one don't you without checking with a doctor or investigating it further. That's it and especially I guess the younger generation they're more engaged in their health than ever before there's more choices there's influences on social media that sort of help guide that decision making and that's fine in and of itself but what we're trying to say is actually look we are all very different perhaps we're not quite serving these differences as best we can by just allowing people to make their decisions off something as, as, as flippant as oh, I saw a celebrity speak yeah. about this. How accurate can a DNA test be in testing for food intolerances? So in certain factors there's a very strong genetic component so lactose tolerance for example mm. so most of the earth uh, of the world's population are lactose intolerant as adults but here in the UK because we're a central northern Europe European ancestry as a rule there tends to be a higher prevalence of lactose tolerance as adults that's a genetic mutation which spread and so there's a very different sort of perception to what's normal considering where you grew up and and what you do so actually it's not necessarily that it's it's necessarily more common now but we have more tools available to help us look into that and the genetic factor some of the work we've been doing for the last years um, helps identify that so we can personalize our approach to nutrition and it's interesting our diets have changed so much over the last three to four decades well, back even longer so and the way we um, process food as well the way it's made up has that made a difference in the kind of tolerance levels that people have to different things well there's, there's some theories there and I'm not sure entirely of the sort of the scientific evidence to say that mere you know, food manufacturing processes definitely changed that but allergies are on the rise intolerances mm -hmm. are on the rise and what's clear from this is people's perceptions mm -hmm. of their own food intolerances and the way they respond to food is definitely increasing as well okay and Andrew I do just have to ask you about your personal story because you are a bronze medalist Beijing 2008 four by 400 meters but you only became a bronze medalist eight years after the games remind us what happened because it is an incredible story yeah so I mean I spent my years uh, years as a professional Olympic athlete and I um, finished fourth in the relay in Beijing 2008 and was subsequently upgraded to bronze when the Russian team were retrospectively disqualified for an anti-doping infringement mm. um, so I got the medal last year nine years after the race I was officially became an Olympic medalist eight years after the race. And this so. is you taking an unofficial stand on the podium there to thank people for your medal because you found out on a shopping trip in New York. That's right, yes, yeah, I was away, I was away on holiday in New York and I found out through a tweet that I was actually an Olympic medalist at that point, which is a good, a good way to find out yeah. and actually I'm very happy to do so. But I think like that's quite clear to so, say, well, look, in my career, I had to, you know, work with experts and find the yeah, right yeah, food yeah. and the right training and so on. And I'm glad now we're able to work in, and nowadays in this role in my life, I'm able to work in helping people understand that too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, look, it's not always as easy as being an Olympic athlete and having an expert to tell you, 
people like yeah. what to eat. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, and as we know, other things play a part in success, as with the <laughs> the Russians and, and doping. And um, Angie, thank you so much for coming in to tell us your story and to tell us what a nutrichondriac is. Uh, we're going to have a look at the.